Hi, everyone. It's KJ here with another episode of The Why Loop, where I, along with some of my closest friends from MIT, talk about anything from startups and tech to college and early adulting. We're not experts by any means, but hopefully our insights can help you out as you navigate your lives. Today, we'll be talking about how we went about choosing our career paths, the differences between joining a startup and a large corporation. And we'll also talk about getting more advanced degrees like a master's or PhD. For our YouTube watchers, we want this to be as interactive as possible. So after you leave a like on this video, make sure to interact with us in the live chat. If you really want to get us our attention, you can send us a super chat as well. And if you think this live stream will be useful to any of your friends or family, make sure to share it with them. Uh, today, we have Kevin on the show. How are you doing, Kevin? Doing well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's always great to have you. Um, usually, like if you're one of the usual Y Loop watchers, I know that you're also used to seeing some other people on the stream, but today it'll just be Kevin and I, but I think we have some pretty good insights on the topics. Um, the first thing that I wanted us to talk about is kind of how you, when you started deciding what you wanted to do post-college, like was that right away before you even went in or is that something you kind of developed throughout yeah um so i went into college um with a rotc scholarship so i kind of had that in mind uh joining the navy after i graduate and um so that's what i've done um but at the same time i'd always been interested in companies and exploring uh professional and career development throughout college and then preparing myself best for following my, my Navy commitment. So, um, yeah, through internships and, um, just different like career fairs and, uh, externships, the, the mini internship program for the winter period that we'd have at MIT, just kind of getting my hand in different fields and seeing kind of what company atmosphere. I like best. Yeah. Um, I guess you mentioned career fairs. Uh, for the people that are just watching, I'm pretty sure a lot of colleges and universities do these. And it's this thing where once a year, you know, companies come in and have different booths. And then we get to, I mean, really just, it's like speed dating for companies. You're just kind of going from booth to booth, <laughs> hoping that somebody likes you. You're just, <laughs> I had a folder just full of resumes, just handing them out. Just freshman year, just yeah. asking people if you accept freshmen, first of all, and then we don't even have to waste each other's time. You know, you don't you don't accept freshmen. I'll just go to another yeah. company. And it comes to the point where you can see that there's so many different companies out there that you're surely going to find something that's at least like in your field that you like and that you can like pursue further. I don't think I've ever gone to a career fair and it's like, shoot. Uh, there's nothing that I really like at all, but I don't know what your yeah, experience I always, was. I always love the career fairs. Um, even if like you come out not feeling like you found like a company that, uh, you are going to apply to or whatever, it's just good practice giving your elevator pitch, um, like showcasing your skills and, uh, what you're looking for. And, um, I've always gotten a few good companies that I'm like, okay, I could, I want to intern for them or, uh, I want to work with them. And, uh, so it works out and it's a, it's fun to talk to people and just see like kind of what each company's about. It gets me thinking, gets the gears turn in like, Oh, well, they're doing this. Like maybe a company that does this would be cool. Or like there's it might be a market opening for that. So it's just like a good time to really like see what, industries are doing and um what they're looking for in a in a professional mm -hmm. like when you are going into some of these application periods where like it doesn't have to even be a career fair i know there's times where people are just more willing to recruit do you try to get yourself an elevator pitch going depending on the company or do you just go with the flow and ask different questions yeah, I mean, it really just depends on how comfortable you are with like speaking to strangers. Um, I personally like kind of had an idea of my elevator pitch, but I wouldn't like rehearse it. I just kind of go in and 
it's you could honestly just go up to companies that you're not interested in and practice with them um yeah you use the ones where they could just i mean ask you whatever there's no risk involved because you didn't want to work for them anyway and you get the you get the little nerves out from the start of the (laughs) career fair as you see these long lines you just talk to any companies get get in the flow and then you can go talk to the real the real companies that you want to go talk to so yeah that yeah i think that's a great tip actually yeah, I think that's like important because you can rehearse all you want, but then when you're actually doing it, uh, you're going to sound rehearsed and that you don't want to necessarily sound rehearsed and you want to be able to react to the energy of the the recruiter that you're talking to. And so I think, yeah, just practicing with companies you're not super interested in is a good way to do that. Um, and yeah, just keeping it concise, not really going into like super like de- deep depth about it, uh, just kind of keeping it service level. Here's what I do. Here's what I'm good at kind of uh, is a good way of going about it. Yeah, we have a couple of questions in the chat that are around like improving your soft skills. And if this is talking about like just your comfort in speaking with people, I think like Kevin said, it's just going out there and doing it. Because you can go and practice all you want, but that's not going to help you in the real world because a recruiter can have different dynamics. There could be one where they're just asking, you know, how are you doing? Like trying to get you more behavioral. There's some that are more technical. And then there's some that just don't even that have that high of an energy. So you're going to have to keep like advocating for yourself. And they're not really going to pull anything out of you. Like they could be at a larger corporation where they get a ton of applicants anyway, so they can care less unless you wow them. And unless you start getting experience with different situations like that, I don't think you can really um, just practice in your room in the mirror type of thing. You just have to get out there and start doing it. And it's like Kevin said, if you just do it for one with not as high stakes, then there isn't really any risk involved with that. You can mess up completely. Yeah. And also a big part of it is just going in, like telling yourself everything's just here you're here for experience here to practice even if the company is a company that you're super interested in it's not the end of the world if you mess it up and you'll probably do better if you go in not putting that much pressure on yourself at least for me like i always am just trying to stay calm like kind of relax because if i get like super like oh i need to nail this i need to be the best like have my best elevator in your head then, then I'm going to get in my head and I'm going to start using filler words. I'm going to start kind of stumbling over my words and that's just no good. Uh, so I try to stay calm, try to kind of just have fun with it. Yeah. I mean, I just mentioned that um, it's similar to speed dating and I guess it, it is like that. If you get in your own head, you're, you're not really going to get put your best foot forward and you're probably overthinking it much more than the other person is type of thing. So the more comfortable you just get talking to people, I think, It'll just work better in the long run. Um, so yeah. something that I also wanted to mention um, to the people watching is that when you're choosing a different major specifically, I think it's pretty important, especially nowadays with like tuition prices getting pretty high, to know at least some general idea what the, a career path, like a realistic career path in your specific field is. So going into something like aerospace or computer science or chemical engineering, you should have an idea of what you can do post college. Some majors are more geared towards like grad studies and you have to kind of continue learning to really be valuable in that field where others you can just right after graduation, just go straight into a job. Yeah, I think that's a super important point um, because like you said, college is getting expensive. And so like some career paths, uh, you'll go in and you can come out with a bachelor's and get a good job with a company, good signing bonus, and that can take care of uh, any student debt you might have. Um, and then the other ones, it's more of a, okay, you can go into an industry, but you're going to be much better off if you get a master's immediately. And so being able to kind of gauge that and do your, your research, do your due diligence before um, you kind of 
decide on a major um, is a good a good point to consider when choosing your major. Um, it's important that you like set yourself up for success and when it comes to STEM, like most most majors, you're gonna be like well off. Uh, you're gonna find a job or uh, be able to go to grad school or whatever. But um, it's just something definitely to consider, even when choosing a field in STEM. I think. Yeah, Kevin, your audio is actually not that good, so I'm gonna go solo for a bit, and then I'll have you rejoin as soon as you can. Okay. Yeah, so I have a couple questions that I can talk about right now. Um, we got a really good question um, in from Gavin, and it's, do you think a year op is better than a summer internship? And this goes into kind of knowing what your field entails after college. So as I mentioned, there's some fields that have to go in and you have to get extra experience post undergrad in order to be valuable. So you need something like a PhD or a graduate um, school or a graduate degree. And in Kevin, I'm just um, answering this question that came up right now. And it's, do you think a year up is better than a summer internship? And okay. I was just saying that when like it's, it's similar to what we described earlier, where some fields require that post-graduate um, kind of experience. And whether you're going into graduate school or whether you're going into a field that needs a master's or PhD, that will kind of determine it. And your ops are just a way to gain that research experience to lend into that grad school experience, I feel like. And even if you're not going into grad school, if it's one of your earlier years at MIT, then doing research is really helpful just to gain some sort of experience in your field. And you may not even know if graduate studies is right for you. And for the people outside of MIT, your ops are undergraduate research opportunities. And that's just a way where you can work in different labs and work directly with other grad students and professors and just gain some research experience. Yeah, I think your ops, uh, it kind of just depends on what you're interested in doing. Uh, also, is my audio better now? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so your ops, if you're more interested in grad school, that's like a great opportunity to kind of get close with a professor or a lab um, that could help you uh, going into grad school. Um, also, your ops, like as a, if you're just finishing your freshman year, like, your ops are a good option to get some experience uh, because it might be hard to find a company that's um, open to hiring freshmen. Um, so it just kind of depends. Uh, I would explore both options and then s try to get offers and uh, opportunities in each. And then you can decide and choose what seems more interesting to you. Yeah. And we have a similar question or I guess along the same veins from John and it, um, he asked, hi guys, just wanted to ask that basically for freshman internships, just graduate undergrads, grades in college matters a lot, or not as much as projects, activities that you have done during school. Um, and I guess I can hit that question first. And I think it's, it's a bit of both. Um, definitely leaning a lot more towards the project experience, um, but you definitely have to have some sort of baseline understanding and that's how companies can see you have an understanding is by grades. And so you don't have to really focus too much on getting, say, a straight 4.0 or a 5.0 at MIT and or like versus just gaining that real experience. And in my experience from being on the other side with actually hiring people, something that I definitely um, look for is that real project experience because at the end of the day, it's can you get the job done and not can you like take a test um, properly or, or memorize certain concepts? Yeah, um, I totally agree. Like you need that kind of base foundation from your courses and to be successful in those shows that you can learn new material um, that you would need to be able to like that learn, being able to learn is important 
for any new job that you're going to go to because your classes aren't going to prepare you for every job. Um, and then, so like that base kind of knowledge from your courses uh, does matter. But I also, I think like your experience is probably a little more valuable because that shows like, okay, you're able to go have this vision and get it to the end state. Um, whether it's related to s stuff you have studied or not, you're going to be able to execute the the vision that you have for this project and get come to a final product. And that's really what matters. And along the way, you might use some like optimization techniques that you've learned throughout your uh, coursework. But in reality, that can be learned along the way that can be Googled oftentimes, um, as long as you kind of have that base understanding that you might have gotten from your coursework. Yeah, I kind of see it as um, learning how to learn and learning how to discover the path to solving a specific problem. So I would much rather have someone on my team that is experienced with getting an idea from conception all the way through prototyping and testing and then actually deploying versus someone that had like a 4.0 in all of their machine learning classes type of thing. Like um, that shows me that you're able to study and that you understand the technical side of things, but it doesn't show me that you can actually build anything. And that's the big thing at the end of the day. Um, and going back to your ops, I know, Jonathan's doing a good job of answering some questions in the comments section, but yeah, your ops can definitely also just give you quality hands-on experience that can just be transferred to industry right away also. So it's not even like a dead period of time um, doing research. You're always going to be learning. And it's another thing where you're learning how to just bring something to completion um, beyond just yeah. the technical side of things. So next I want yeah. to get into the different things you considered when figuring out like what you wanted to do over the summer um, in terms of like internships or your ops or anything else, basically. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I guess freshman year, it was really, I want to just do something um, interesting. And so I uh, found Northrop Grumman uh, and that worked out. But I was also looking at your ops um, within the aerospace department. So I was more focused on doing something aerospace and kind of getting my foot in that game um, because, um, you know, it's like freshman year, you're trying to figure out what you want to do still. And so I figured I'm interested in aerospace. Let's go do something aerospace. So, and then other years, it was more like uh, trying to kind of, go with interests that I've started to develop as I've uh, been in the aerospace department, taking some courses. So after my sophomore year, I did a MISTI program and that was kind of like building on some language courses I in cultural courses that I took. Um, and I went to Jordan and did some mechanical engineering there. So that was really cool. And then after that, I got did some like externship work, and that got me more interested in like startups and software um, and like robotics. So then I was kind of looking in those fields. So it, for me, it was a lot of just my interests at the time. Um, so uh, I don't know if that's kind of how you feel as well, um, but I really just did it based on like my current interests. I think. Yeah, and could you touch a little bit about what externships are for people that? may not know what that phrase is. Yeah. So um, for the January uh, period that we have off, we have we had all of January off uh, every year. And that's like the independent activities period. So uh, you can do like an externship, a year off. Uh, you can do nothing. You can take a mini course. And so um, an externship is just like a mini internship, usually offered by an MIT alumni. Um, and so that's a good way to go for, for the four weeks that we have and uh, maybe make a little extra money or gain some experience and um, just kind of explore a new field, possibly. Yeah, I mean, those are very useful um, experiences. And I guess personally, I went through 
a similar path. I mean, I also started at Northrop Grumman in freshman year. It felt like a rite of passage way for aerospace, just getting into a large aerospace <laughs> corporation and seeing what those vibes are. Uh, I was actually a software yeah. engineer, so I got into the different coding aspects of things also. And I actually used the next summer as a, tr a, a way to compare the software versus the hardware. So I was more on like a hardware team doing actual physical tests on the vibration chamber and sound tests and acoustic tests and stuff like that. And I got to go into clean rooms and actually work physically with stuff that's going to go into space. And that was really cool too. And I think for the people watching, when you're going into um, college, you're not going to really understand what all of the different experiences in your field entail. So internships are definitely a good way to make that comparison in your head so you actually understand what that specific thing entails. So like I knew what it felt like to sit a con at a computer and just code. And then I knew what it felt like to actually be in the lab every day. And then when I started seriously considering grad school, that's when the next summer I did research at Stanford to really flesh out that experience of being a full-time researcher and see if that's something that I want to do. Because ultimately, you're going to have to make some sort of commitment post-graduation. And um, the more knowledge you know, I think the better equipped you'll be. But I think yeah. something that we can talk about next is definitely that you're not married to any specific career path post-college. And I think you have some opinions on that as well, I think. Yeah, definitely. So, like, I did internships with, like, mechanical engineering, uh, aerospace, and, like, software type things. So I've, like, kind of jumped around. And I am majored in aerospace, but by no means uh, do I feel tied to going into the aerospace industry. And I don't think I like there are a lot of opportunities outside of that. So it kind of depends on where things go, but your major doesn't really limit you um, at all. And I think internships were a good time for me to explore that and figure out, okay, what do I like? What I not really like as much. And so now like I can decide kind of what projects I want to pursue, where I want to go and focus my efforts to build my skills and so you can really just go wherever I feel like as long as you kind of build your experience and you have like some some footing to like stand on and say like I know how to do machine learning or I know how to do some sort of software development even if you did a mechanical engineering degree like if you have the skills and any degree really people will hire you um, it's really just about that that experience uh, kind of I think and having that base foundation from like being able to get a degree. Yeah, I think that's very valuable insight. Like even at Chipbrain, which is a company I also work with, we just hired this really talented uh, machine learning scientist and his undergrad was mechanical engineering and he actually did consulting post um, undergrad. And so there wasn't really any tangible job experience in that field or even academic experience but then he ended up studying it on his own really getting interested in it and was able to do a couple projects on his own and even in these larger um, like competitions throughout the world and testing data sets and actually deploying ml models he was like number one uh, at some point and so like it really doesn't matter what your general background is, it could help you in that first one, um, get you that like exposure and have someone actually interview you and take you seriously. But beyond that, this goes into us favoring like projects over grades in a specific subject. If you can prove that you can actually be a good contributor um, in whatever field, I think that's the most important thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. And for now, I think... Um, I just wanted to quickly say that for our YouTube watchers, I want you to please click the like button for the YouTube algorithm because it really helps us out. And also to check out the join button under the video to get some cool perks like custom emojis and access to a Discord server with other members, some of my friends and me. 
And we just really want to build a strong sense of community and want like-minded individuals to build off one another's motivations. So that's why we are pubbing that Discord channel. Um, but back to kind of not getting married to a specific field, I think we're also in a different age nowadays where people are allowed to explore these interests. I think now more than ever, I think especially even in COVID times, people are mm -hmm. more understanding of going from one field to another and really finding what they truly want to do. And it isn't even coming off as disrespectful anymore as people are just working remotely and trying to contribute in whatever way is possible. I don't know if you've experienced that yeah. too or have seen that. In, yeah, like it's uh, with the ability to learn new skills so easily uh, just from the internet, um, you can really... Um, is my audio staticky again? Yeah. Oh, man. Um, okay. well, we'll figure this out for next time, but I'll get you right back in. Okay. But yeah, with the... With any given field, there's a sense of like passion that I think different people have to invoke in that field for them to push forward in a way that's meaningful for them. And if you have that sort of motivation that you really like that given field, then you're going to really work harder in actually like pushing through those tougher times. If you're actually motivated and you're really passionate about that specific field, then I know there's that like cliche term that if you really you're truly passionate about what you're doing, then it won't ever feel like work. But there is some truth to that, that if you're doing something that you're really passionate about, you're going to want to work because you're going to want to like solve these different problems and you're going to want to continue to learn in that specific field. And I think that's really powerful. And I would always recommend to the people around me to always just pursue what they want to at any given moment, even if it's not what they wanted to pursue, say, two years ago, or if it wasn't in their five or 10 year plan, like it's OK. Just do what makes you happy right now. And I think you'll get better results out of that and you'll get more career growth. Yeah, and your interests change over time. So that's totally like natural. Um, and it's important to always be like reevaluating. Am I doing what I enjoy? Am I doing what I think will get me to where I want to be? Um, and I think it's important as like a, new grad going into a career to not necessarily be like, okay, I got this job at this uh, big company or this good startup or whatever it may be. And knowing like, I don't have to stay with them for my career. I don't have to stay with them for even five years. Like it's um, oftentimes it can be beneficial to go into a, your first job for a couple years, get that experience. And then you can take that experience and go to another company and really move up your position. Um, whereas a lot of times in companies, they have set like timelines and benchmarks for employees to progress through the company. And so the person that was hired two years ago, like ahead of you, they're going to progress ahead of you, regardless of whether you're performing better or not, just because the timeline there and they have like set career benchmarks. So then by moving to another company, you can kind of skip that and move up without having the, the time in the company uh, restraint. Um, so it's always good to be kind of reconsidering and seeing like what opportunities are out there. Um, yeah, I think you're getting into kind of the nuances between working at a startup versus working at a more established company. And that's definitely something that I wanted to talk about today because I don't think a lot of people truly understand what the differences are and the actual like risk involved with each one and kind of comparing those two to grad school. So I think that's a nice segue to get into because I've also seen some comments in the chat uh, talking about them. And first of all, I want to say that right off the bat, I'm definitely startup bias because I really enjoy working with startups. So the way I phrase things, keep that in mind. Like I'm not trying to say that startups are for everyone, but I'm deeply engulfed in the startup space. And that's something that I'm really passionate about. So 
sorry if that passion comes off too strong. I'm ne- definitely not saying that that's <laughs> the only thing that you should do. Um, but I guess we can first talk about kind of startups and then we'll get into companies after that. So I think with startups, the biggest thing that people consider with them is that risk versus reward ratio that they're trying to calculate in their head for themselves. And I think it's also pretty nuanced because a company that just got to 500 people, they're still a startup when, if they've been around for just a couple of years versus like a larger established corporation that has tens of thousands of employees. And you can really even kind of pull that lever of risk, I think. You can join a startup that has less than 10 people, or you can join a startup that has 100 to 500 that's already gone past their Series A and their Series B. And I think it's a much bigger um, difference in terms of risk. And in terms of the reward, as you as that company size grows, your risk starts going down, but then your reward also starts going down. So if you join as a startup founder, for example, you'll have a lot of shares in that company, but you might your pay might be not as guaranteed. So like if the startup goes through yeah. troubles in the first year or so, and you may not be getting paid at all. Um, but if this uh, company actually becomes successful, then you'll be able to reap all the benefits of that profit and the the prestige and also the like other monetary benefits it comes with having just a successful company. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely agree. Like the, the risk when it comes to startups um, is kind of uh, proportional to the time that it's been around. So like if it's been around for only a couple months or you're a founder, much higher risk. But as the time that it's been around increases, the risk is going to go down. Um, and that's just as they survive longer, they have more of a product, they have more tech that they have developed and probably more funding because they've been able to survive for that long. And so if you get into a startup later, uh, after it's been around, you're probably going to be more on the side of getting like a salary or some sort of actual pay and then also um, some shares. So that's like a very happy like medium. But if you're a founder, there's oftentimes like you might not be getting paid at all, but then you're going to have like a large portion of the shares of the company, um, which could pay out like a lot in the end, um, or it could pay out nothing. It, it, like if the company uh, ends up not working out. So um, just like being able to like understand your risk tolerance when it comes to like startups and how much uh, you need to kind of survive um, and then finding the company that might work for that. And it's kind of, it kind of depends on the startup and what they're doing, but just understanding your risk tolerance, understanding the risk that goes with the specific startup um, is a good starting point to see if that's like a place that would work for you. Mm -hmm. And another reward that, I forgot to touch on, but you touched on earlier is that you can progress in your career a lot faster in a startup where you can come in as just a software engineer, but then you might, you know, in a couple of years already become a VP of engineering in a certain sector because that is the like team and that's the project that you established. And so you'll have the most expertise in that given thing for the company and I think startups are a lot more willing to kind of bet on someone that's just motivated and passionate about working on something versus the kind of decades of experience, especially if they're working on something new, because you just need someone that's motivated and willing to put in the work because anybody's going to be, anybody's going to have to put in the work because it's something that's so new. Um, Mm -hmm. We have a related question from John that says, when working with startups, do you have to worry too much on the business aspects of the startup, such as shares, stocks, ownership, CEO, CTO, et cetera. And I think it goes into what we were talking about in terms of when you enter a startup. If you enter it within the first year, um, definitely in my experience, I've had to take on some of those hats. So I've had to do these pitch events, had to sign different paperwork, actually get people onboarded type of stuff. Like you wear many hats, so you might have to lead a couple of different departments and 
you're the HR person, but you're also the recruiter and you're also an actual engineer. But then if it's more established, if it's been established for a couple of years, they might have a product already going with consistent revenue, then, you know, they'll already have an HR department and they'll already have recruiters and they'll already have lawyers and stuff like that. That'll keep everything going smoothly where you won't really have to notice it. It's already feels more towards like a more established company at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Like if you're a founder, you're probably going to be dealing with a lot of the business stuff um, just to kind of get it up and running. Um, And then after you kind of start getting investment and can bring other people on board, they can, you can get someone to handle that kind of stuff that is more experienced, knows what they're doing. Um, so unless you're the one that knows everything about business, then you're bringing technical people on board. Mm-hmm. And we have another question that's also related. Have you seen people who got experience in service for a few years and then came back to grad school for PhD? Um, do you have any experience with people like that? Um, yeah, I, not anyone in particular, like off the top of my head, but I can totally see that being um, something that is done. And it seems like, uh, honestly, like a pretty good way of going about it because um, you can kind of get some experience and add that to your resume uh, when applying to grad school and maybe get into a much uh, better grad school or PhD program that shows like I have done like this new and um, kind of developed this new tech uh, and made it a product. And now I'm coming back to learn more, I guess. Yeah, I think it's along the same lines of when we talked about gaining project experience. In general, startups is just like the, if you're one of the founders, it's a very high risk project experience that you're hoping that catches on. And if it's successful, even if it's not successful, you gain valuable project experience. And I think grad schools would actually appreciate that on top of your undergraduate experiences and for me personally like I got into Stanford first and then I took a leave of absence and I can up to two years decide when I want to come back and so now I'm using this time to also experience the startup life and if it ends up not being for me then yeah I can go back to grad school or vice versa I don't think doing one hinders your prospects of doing the other um, the only thing that I would say is that if you choose to do grad school first, um, that post grad school, you'll still, you need to make sure that you have that kind of passion for entrepreneurship versus passion for like teaching or passion versus industry. Because I think at that point, especially if you're a technical PhD, you'll have opportunities around you that'll come your way. And so I think startups, you're more likely to see them come out of undergrad because they're like motivated and they want to make change right now type of thing where in grad school, you kind of learn the constant grind of just learning more in your field and you gain that quality experience. But I don't see um, downsides of doing one before the other really. Mm -hmm. So we've gotten a lot into startups. Um, I guess we we should shift gears into industry and the differences there. And I guess I can give a general summary of what I have in my head. And I think the, the, the main thing of industry that I see from people that are in it right now, and by industry, I mean larger corporations that are more established and definitely have a lot of funding and just stability. And I think it's that safety and that comfort that everybody Um, is really geared towards whether you're working at a Google or a Facebook or an established um, firm in finance, you're going to always have that peace of mind that, you know, you're going to work whatever hours you work. Mostly it's going to be nine to five and then you're going to be able to come home and do whatever you want to do. Um, In the reverse side of things, you may not get um, compensated as much as you would say having a more risky role at a startup where you may be in charge of more people. Um, But on the flip side of things, you can do things like go on vacation whenever you want have some quality paid time off. You can, um, you know, spend weekends more or less stress-free depending on your job. And I think 
those are definitely very valuable things. And I don't judge someone going in that direction because for a lot of people, that's just what they want to do. And that's comfort to them. And that's what feels good. And by all means, you have to do what you're comfortable in. Otherwise, it's just going to adversely affect your career. Yeah. And with these established companies, there's also the idea of this is experience that you're going to get right out the gate that is highly respected across the industry. Like if you go to work for Google or you go to work for any aerospace corporation, something that's established, people recognize that they see it as experience where you've worked for this company. They kind of know what the company is and it is all about. Um, and so it's something like that is, can be respected experience. Say after two years, you want to go and, start a startup or go to grad school or maybe go to another company people recognize hey this person worked at this company and um it's not just like some random startup that they've never heard of that may have failed like so that's kind of where it may be a better fit for some people um, depending on what you're looking to do Um, so definitely like a good place to go right out of college to kind of get that base experience um, that people will recognize across industry. Yeah. And so, yeah, the, the audio issues are happening again. Um, sorry, everybody. I think I will definitely get this figured out for next time, but I'll get you right back in. Yeah. So as we wait for Kevin to come back in, um, something that he was really good at mentioning was that when we are um, deciding between these different opportunities, we really need to keep in mind like the types of experience that we want and the type of um, projects that we want to be a part of. So even in something like industry, you'll have the opportunity to work on projects that you'll like um, and projects that you'll be able to get experience in and that you'll be able to show that you're competent in that area. So if you worked on Google's infrastructure, then you can say, look, I worked on really making Google's infrastructure really secure and very, um, very strong. And then you can bring those types of things, those experiences into the, um, any sort of startup or any graduate opportunity in the future. And, those things are transferable. So I've definitely seen people where get a Google or a Facebook and then bring that experience to a newer startup where they can show what are industry best practices that you wouldn't have learned otherwise if you didn't go into um, that specific company in the first place. So I have another question here from Gavin. And he asks, what are your thoughts on engineers working in finance? Are they valued as they've studied a really difficult degree? Or are their quantitative skills actually put to work? And I think we've experienced this a lot at MIT because a lot of engineers turn consultants uh, by the time they become seniors. And I think the big reason why they're very wanted and very coveted is because they understand that industry and they understand the nuances in that. So a chemical engineer would know how to close chemical engineering deals because they may know a little bit more than just someone who has a finance degree who had no experience in that field. And also you touched on, yeah, the analytical skills where you're already kind of thinking in this problem-solving mindset. So that's why you see a lot of tech people and people that were in engineering And how easily that's transferable into something like a startup because you're already trying to solve these different problems and you're trying to think in that frame of mind. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that question, Kevin. Um, Yeah, like people definitely go into finance uh, and apply their engineering background there. Um, There's a lot of work and um, things to be done in that, uh, in like the fintech space. Um, And from what I know and like people I've talked to um, who have done that, they are like applying a lot of like algorithmic type things. Um, and it's a lot of like computer science, um, just optimization kind of uh, stuff. But personally, I don't have much experience in the FinTech space. Um, 
So it's definitely something to consider uh, if that's something you're interested in uh, and want to work uh, long hours um, from the people that I know doing it and kind of be on call uh, for your company at all times, then uh, it might be good experience for the first couple of years. But for me personally, I don't foresee myself uh, really interested in doing that um, kind of work, um, at least in the near future, maybe eventually. But uh, yeah, it's definitely a good spot to be. It's not bad. Yeah. I mean, it comes into some of the risk reward stuff we were talking about. Like you definitely get compensated very generously and you'll be able to travel and talk to like really important people type of thing. But you might also, you know, come home from the office at 11 p.m. or midnight uh, when you came in 9 a.m. that morning and you have to dress all nice every day. Um, Yeah. yeah, And so, I mean, it's it's for different people and it's it's just like startups aren't for everybody consulting isn't for everybody and industry isn't for anybody um but something that we haven't really touched too much about is grad school and i think i went to reserve kind of the tail end of this episode for that um so like as i just mentioned i actually applied to and got into the master's and phd program at stanford i was going to go in for autonomous systems in the aerospace department and so if anyone has any questions, feel free to leave them in the chat. But the general thing that I wanted to say for grad school is that it's definitely a grind, um, if, especially if undergrad took a toll on you and if you worked really hard every day. Um, that's why a lot of people take gap years before they get into grad school. Um, but you'll have to be prepared to continue to take those classes, continue the research environment, and just continue to learn. And in the meanwhile, like, honestly, you will not get compensated that much. You know, you kind of get the bare bones um, with in terms of living expenses. You'll have enough for your dorm and maybe your food, um, but not much beyond that. But I think PhD programs especially are definitely for people that are truly passionate about that field. And because there's going to be many long nights and because it's strung out over five to seven, some people even eight to 10 years, then you really need to be passionate in that field and you can't just be doing it to do it. Um, You really definitely need that intrinsic motivation. Otherwise you're just going to stop somewhere through it. Um, I guess that that's my point of view, but in general, I think the reward is you're the most knowledgeable person in that specific field that you studied and, there's so little people that get a PhD because it's so difficult. But then once you get there, now you're a doctor and now people come to you for advice on your field because you're a true expert in it. And there's all the, I guess, pros and cons that come immediately to my head. Yeah. And there are uh, definitely like PhDs that you do your PhD program and do your research in uh, a lab and, people can, you can take that research and start a company out of it. And so that's like a possible reward um, that you might get from doing a PhD program um, along with that mastery of the subject. So I have a few friends that have experience with this that have done master's programs or PhD programs and the lab that they are working in, um, they took that tech and the IP that they created and brought it into industry and applied it to a specific uh, product that they are now building and doing quite well. And so that is always um, like a big upside from being on the cutting edge of a field. And so there are some questions about like combining um your like grad school with like projects and startups and just yeah on that point um you can work for startups while you're in grad school you can do all of this stuff at the same time it really just depends on kind of what is your priority how much time you have um and making like that schedule for yourself where you can stick 
to um, like completing all your grad work and doing well on that while also maybe supporting a startup um, as like a consultant um, and giving that kind of technical knowledge and guiding them uh, as like an advisor. And I know KJ uh, has experience kind of doing that um, for his first semester uh, at Stanford and um, you know, it's all, everything, anything's possible if you can like find the time for it, I guess. Yeah, I think that a big thing with all of these things that we're talking about is that you really have to be passionate about what specific thing you're doing. And if you're going to take something away from this episode, it's definitely that whether it's a startup, whether it's industry, whether it's actually doing grad school, if you are not passionate about what you're doing, then you're not going to continue to be as successful as you possibly could be. Um, for people really passionate about industry and working in these large corporations and pushing them forward, that's where they're going to succeed the most. And that's where they're going to reap the most benefits. And for them, when they work decades in a specific company, they feel fulfilled as a company grows. For a startup, getting maybe getting it from say, three people to 200 people and past Series B is the only thing that that person wants to contribute. Um, and they want to work for other um, companies to just be in that growth phase. And someone in grad school may not care about money whatsoever, and they just want to be that person who's the doctor in their family or that expert in their specific field. So... I wouldn't even be able to say a blanket statement about whether or not you should do one versus the other. So in general, hopefully like the different things that we've mentioned here really helped you out. And right now I just want to go to the comments and answer some questions before the end of this hour. So we have another question from Gavin. And he asks, what's more important at grad school, the pedigree of the university you go to or your supervisor? And that's actually a great question. And a lot of people going into the whole application process, they really can have to consider this because with a supervisor, it may be the exact thing that you want to do. Whereas the school might be, you know, yeah, it will have that prestige, but Again, you're going to be doing this thing for five to seven years, maybe up to a decade. So if you don't find a supervisor that you can actually work with at that school, I don't think it's worth the um, prestige of that school because ultimately you won't be doing your best work. And at the end of the day, if you have a PhD, you have a PhD. And whether you got that from MIT or Stanford or a school that's more local, that's the main thing because you're going to really have to buckle down for it and people understand the work that is entailed when getting something like a PhD. We have another question from June and they asked, do UAV related companies in US hire international engineers? I've heard in the space field, it's very difficult to find a job for internationals. This is something that I've had experience with at the first company I interned at that we talked about. And depending on if they that aerospace company has government contracts, then there may be sectors in that company or the company as a whole that can't take international people because they're very US-based. So I think it's very dependent on the very like the specific company that you're going to focus on. And you may be able to find one that will have um, openings for international people. But in general, all I have experience is with um, Northrop Grumman and them specifically. I heard there was a lot of difficulty for international people applying. We have another question coming in that asks, is it possible to do a less research-focused thesis at a master's level? I would prefer to do something design project-oriented. Is that possible? 
And these all come down to the supervisor. Um, I think in general, the supervisor and the specific department can cater a different graduate experience for you and one that you're going to be put in a better place to succeed. So I don't think I can make a blanket statement answering that question because it really is department specific. This question asks, I'm currently studying BS degree in aeronautical engineering. I'm just curious if it's possible for me to take a master's degree in aerospace engineer when it comes to grad school. And I think definitely, those are definitely related fields. And even if it's not related fields, it goes back to my discussion on various um, project experiences. And in general, if you have the project experience that you can show in that specific field, then a graduate program will still want to accept you, whether or not you're a computer scientist going to an aerospace degree or an aerospace degree going to a computer science master's degree program. It really just depends on project experience. We have another question that asks, is it possible to get hired in the aerospace industry with a criminal background, even if you graduate from a top engineering school? And I know people in the past that have actually um, had prior things in their life that they've had to go through, and maybe they have that type of background, but then have later been able to turn it around and even go to schools like Stanford or MIT. Um, so I think it really depends on the program, and obviously it depends on the severity of what happened. But as long as you can show that you contribute positively to a school, I think that schools are a lot more open-minded than you um, may think right away. Since we're getting to the end of everything, I just wanted to say that I'm very grateful for the community that we have here. And thank you for, thank you all for listening to this live stream and um, dealing with us through these uh, technical difficulties that seem to always happen when you get into this type of environment. Um, thank you all for listening to this week's episode of The Why Loop, where we talk about anything from startups and tech to college and early adulting. Make sure to subscribe to the new Why Loop channel on YouTube that will be linked wherever this is posted. And we'll be posting clips from this channel consisting on key points. So make sure to stay tuned for those. For the YouTube watchers, check out the join button under this video to get some cool perks like custom emojis and access to a Discord server with other members, some of my friends and myself. We just want to build a strong community and we want to help you all achieve what you want to in life. As always, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.